We're uh, at the end of chapter 13. Again, we'll pick up at verse 16. Uh, Saul has already begun sort of the unraveling process, and we're going to watch that speed up. Saul, uh, not a man after God's own heart. We learned that in chapter 13. Uh, Saul is a man after Saul's own heart. Saul really uh, is a very self-centered man, always trying to measure up maybe to the height, the stature that he has. His son Jonathan, however, what a guy this guy is. I mean, he reminds me of Caleb in the, old, you know, in the, in the older stories from Joshua and, and uh, just Caleb. What, what a man of faith. Joshua and Caleb, both these guys. And Jonathan sort of is cut from that cloth, a little different than his dad. How many of you would say that uh, you're a whole lot different than your dad? And that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, that's the cool thing about the Lord. Whatever you were born into, you don't have to stay that way. That God can do an individual work in you. You're not locked into a pattern that was handed to you. And Jonathan certainly isn't locked into the pattern that was handed to him of manhood or what it means to, to serve the Lord or walk with God. Jonathan had stirred up this battle with the Philistines. He had attacked their garrison. Uh, Saul had uh, kind of gathered in. He gathered 300 and 30,000 uh, of his troops, or excuse me, 330,000 troops of the Philistines had gathered and uh, just spread out everywhere. And they were, and then Saul's people begin to, begin to scatter. They scatter and, and he gets nervous about that. So he, uh, he offers a, an offering and doesn't wait for Samuel. And this is when things begin to uh, devolve for him. He says, therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. It was not Saul's place to do. He begins to take to himself things that he doesn't deserve, places that he's not supposed to have. And so we pick up in verse 16. Saul, uh, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. There's about uh, 600 of Saul's now personal guard, those that stayed with him while the others fled. But the Philistines encamped at Michmash, about four miles from where they were. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. That's not a football team. The raiders were the, the Philistine raiding parties. And one company turned on the road to Ophrah, to the land of, of Shuol. Another company turned to the road to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now, this is a verse that's very important to me very sad to me, the saddest verses in the Bible. There was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. See why this is such a sad verse to me? There was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So evidently, the Philistines had uh, somehow dispatched all of those that were familiar with ironwork in Israel. Now the Philistines introduced iron, most feel, to the Middle East or to that area, to Israel, to that region, to, to the land of Canaan. They were, uh, uh, had, had iron chariots, and they had all, you know, iron-tipped weapons and all kinds of things. And uh, the Israelites were sort of dependent on them for these skills and, and for this provision. So the Philistines, now controlling the area, they're controlling the military by not allowing the, uh, the, the Israelites to make and to work with iron. So they're at a great disadvantage as part of how you they were being oppressed by the Philistines. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. These were the weapons that the Israelites had. All they had was gardening tools to fight with. And we're meant to notice at what a weakened condition they are, at what a, a, um, uh, a disadvantage they are relative to the Philistines. Uh, they have to go, when they want something sharpened, they got to go down to the Philistine shop and get it sharpened. And uh, they didn't have this ability themselves. And the charge for sharpening was a pim for the plowshares. My, how times have changed. How much is a pim? Three quarters of a shekel. That helps, doesn't it? <laughs> and the mattocks, the forks, the axes, and to set the points of the goad. So the goad would be wooden, but then the tip would be made of iron. You could, uh, you could sharpen it and, and make it sharp again when it became dull. So it came about on the day of the battle, that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. So evidently, 
For some reason, the Philistines allowed Saul and Jonathan to have swords, weapons, but uh, as far as the rest of the Israelites, they weren't allowed to have anything except for uh, just these gardening tools. So, you know, the they, Philistines felt fairly confident that they're not going to be a problem with gardening tools. Uh, but, you know, what the Israelites had was God. And all they had to do was obey God. And they didn't need, they, they've won battles when Samuel prayed. They won battle without ever lifting any kind. You didn't even need a shovel. They didn't need anything. God would take care of them. All they had to do was obey the Lord and trust him, put their trust in him. And you can't, isn't it hard to obey someone you don't trust? And so trust, remember, trust and obedience go hand in hand. And trust is not a trust, uh, I'm scared of you trust. The trust in the Lord is based on, on his faithfulness, and his faithfulness is based on his love. So trusting in the Lord always traces back to his love and his promises for us, for them. So the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Now, chapter 14, it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. So that's what we've read already. He's got this group of 600, maybe private guards, personal uh, detail that stay with him. Ahija, the son of a high tub, not a hot tub, a high tub. Ichabod's brother, remember Ichabod? Ichabod, that's what they named the, the baby after the Ark of the Philistines was stolen and Eli found out, he falls off his chair and then the, uh, Ichabod's mom gives birth and I, I think she dies in birth if I'm remembering right and, and Ichabod's name means the glory is departed. And so Ichabod, he's still alive, he's, he's been named, hey, uh, Ahijah the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, hey, this guy named the glory has departed, and, and which it hadn't, by the way, the son of Phineas, that was the, the priest, and the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. Remember, Hophni and Phineas were both killed in battle. The Lord's priest in Shiloh was wearing an ephod, but the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. So again, Michmash, about four miles from Gibeah. Interesting that, that we get this note that Jonathan didn't tell his father. And I wonder, I wonder why that was. I mean, obviously I can't say you know, we don't know why, what was going on in Jonathan's mind, but it's interesting to speculate about the relationship between Jonathan and his father. You know, Jonathan had been the first one to attack the garrison of the Philistines, but Saul got the credit. Everybody said, hey, Saul's attacked the, the Philistine garrison. That may be because Saul was the, the king, and it just automatically, anything that, anything that happens in Israel gets credited to King Saul. But, you know, maybe there were some other things going on. Maybe Jonathan saw some other things in his dad that uh, he just wasn't really appreciative of, and so he decides, you know what, I don't want to get my dad involved. You know, and his dad's the king. So here's his son, his dad's the king, and he goes, you know what, I'm not going to tell the king. This is a pretty bold thing that he's doing. I'm just going to go and, and take this matter into my own hands. So uh, Jonathan, he's just kind of, as we go through, Jonathan's kind of a doer. I like Jonathan, and you'll see why uh, I think God gives our attention to Jonathan as we read this. So between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. Do we have slides back there? If you could pull those slides up while I read this. I'm going to put some pictures up here for you to see. Because uh, when we talk about sharp rocks in Israel, uh, we're talking about uh, a geographic location type of things. And don't you know they're still there today? We're not talking about, uh, we're talking about things that stay there. So there, there's... I don't know if that map makes any sense to you. Go to the next picture. Let's see what the next picture is up there. There's the, uh, the pass. That's the pass that, uh, that people would, would pass through to get to Michmash. And go to the uh, next picture. There's, uh, so you see that the, the pass is shown there, the normal way to get to uh, Michmash. But then there's those steep, rocky cliffs that are circled there, kind of in the center. And that's where Jonathan is going to approach from. He's not going to go the normal route. He's going to take the hard way in uh, so that he kind of comes in under the radar a little bit. He's not going to, you know, they're going to see him if he comes down the road through. You know, a pass is, is a pass. It's just that. That's where road people have to come in and out. That's the easy way to get in and out. But the, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the normal way. But then, so climbing up 
so Jonathan is really the first kind of, well, you could say solo, you know, free climber. I'm sure he's not all harnessed in and all that, but he decides to climb this, uh, this kind of rock face, sharp rock face, to get to uh, the Philistine garrison. So the name of one of these rocky crags was Bozes, and the name of the other is Sena. Now, Bozes means the gleaming one. That was probably the one on the south side that would catch the sun. And the other one was Sena. That means the thorny one. Can you guess why it was called the thorny one? I bet you people didn't climb up that one very often. So the front of one faced northward opposite Michmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. And we kind of delineated which those might be. So, Verse 6 says, Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Now there's your refrigerator magnet verse right there. There's your license plate, you know, whatever you, this is the verse. Because this tells us a lot about Jonathan. Isn't it true? The statements we make that come from our heart, this is what Jesus says, it's out of the heart the mouth speaks. Now what you say kind of in, in, a, in a controlled group when you're here in church, well you can fake that. You can say the right things. What you say when nobody else is around, what you say to yourself, what you say to a small group, what you say to a, your husband, your wife, your kids, those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that are coming from your heart when you're not on stage, so to speak. And that's, you know, Jonathan's not on stage. He's not speaking to the army. It's just him and his armor bearer. And what he's, what he's bearing is his heart. He calls them these, these uncircumcised. And we're going to see a huge contrast between Jonathan and Saul. Let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. These are people outside of the covenant of God. These are not God's people. We, armor bearer, are God's people. And if we trust him, God will work for us. And he knows the story of Gideon and how God used 300, a 300 man army to rout something like 135,000 Midianites or something like that in, in Judges chapter 6. And he knows the story of Caleb. And Caleb's great, we'll, we'll, we'll eat those, they're giants, we'll eat them like bread. You know, they're, these guys, these are men, women of faith. Deborah, Barak, and men and women of great faith. And so Jonathan says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. See, Jonathan is thinking in terms of God. Saul is always thinking in terms of people, his dad. But Jonathan, it's always, it's always about God and God's people and God's victory. But for Saul, it's always about Saul. And you'll watch that. You see, I like this about Jonathan because Jonathan doesn't say, hey, we need to tell other people to go and attack the garrison. That's not how Jonathan rolls. Some people in the church, they want to gather everybody else to do it. They don't want to do it. They just want to tell other people what to do. And then some people want to have it. They want the, all the fanfare, all the bells and whistles, and have it on stage, and have it announced, and the church has got, we've got to gather a group, and we've got to start a committee, and then we're going to do this thing, and I'm going to see it through, and I'm going to oversee it. And, and that doesn't always, you know, that's not always a bad thing, but I've met a lot of people that that's their first step. You know, boom, right out of the starting gate, they want to get the big thing going, get the moon bounce, get the whole thing going. But I, I just like Jonathan's, just men and women that they don't need to rally a big group. They're, they're not going to come and say, well, the church needs to do this, the church needs to do that. They see a need, and they do it. They just, they just say, you know, hey, look, we don't need a lot of people. You know, God, it's amazing. Haven't you seen what God can do with just one person? I, I wrote it in my Yahoo group message to you all. Uh, William Carey missionary, 41 years on the mission field in India. I texted at Kishore. You know who Kishore is, right, from a and I believe, now don't quote me on this, but I think I'm, I've got it accurate. I believe Kishore pastored a church in India that was planted by William Carey. Am I right in that? Phil, you remember? Is that true? He, or he's preached there. Uh, so William Carey's legacy lives on in India and when he preached this message that included this quote, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God, that was kind of the starting of this, the, the modern day missions movement. And William Carey went with one other couple and they went over to India and started, and 41 years spent there. Sometimes the, be and th the best and most powerful ministries are when God just moves you to do it. 
And if God is moving you to do it, the church leadership can't stop it. And if God isn't moving, if it's just you moving to do it, then no matter how, how, how much help we give you, we can't sustain it. If God isn't in it, we can't make it fly. So I like this about William Carey. I like this about Gideon. The, I, I think that stories like this motivate men and women like William Carey and, and many others throughout history that nothing restrains the Lord. Do you see that? Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. God can use either one. He can use a big group or he can use a small group. He can use one person. And I enjoy that. And I, I like verse 7 because, uh, because it's not just Jonathan alone. I think it would be so easy for us to overlook the armor bearer, wouldn't it? As just some throwaway guy who's with him. I mean, I thank God for people in my life that have been armor bearers for me. And some people just, that's their ministry. They don't want to be the guy leading the charge. They don't want to be the guy out in front. They just want to be the support person. You know, I'll hold your Bible for you. I'll come, I'll pray for you. I'll travel with you. I'll encourage you. But don't make me speak. <laughs> don't put me up in front of people. And, and we had, when, when Calvary Chapel Flu Van started, there were, there were some armor bearers that came right along and said, well, look at what verse 7 says. It says, so his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. See, twice right there, the word heart is used. That's awesome in ministry. Not just obligation, but when people's hearts are joined together in battle. When people's hearts are joined together in the Lord's call in their lives. I mean, it's awesome. It's, it's, cause man, it's tough. I just uh, got an email. We have a pastor's meeting here tomorrow morning and some guys come from Charlottesville to the pastor's meeting out here and a friend of mine, he's just getting involved in church planting uh, now in, in Charlottesville area. And he sent me an email back. I sent the reminder out, hey, church uh, pastor's meeting tomorrow morning. And he said, oh man, I can't wait to be there because it's been a hard week. And I don't know what's going on in his life, but we're gonna get together and, and, and build him up and encourage him in what he's doing. And, I, and I'm so thankful for the people in the church that build me up and encourage me. But boy, you know, when we stepped out for this, what you see today, it was kind of one of these Jonathan moments. Like we just feel like the Lord is calling us to do this and we can't, it's just us, you know. Calvary Chapel, just so you know, we don't get sent out with big, you know, budgets and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of support. You know what they tell us? Say, well, you know, I, I remember the phone call I called down to Troy Warner, Pastor Troy down in Lynchburg, and I said, you know, we're, we're like, I'm a nobody from nowhere, but can we plant the Calvary Chapel in our community? We'd love to have a, a Calvary Chapel here. And he said, yeah, you know, he gave us some instruction, and and I said, yeah, well, here's what you do. And so we, you know, followed the process, but uh, I just remember that feeling of like, you know, they, say, they tell you, look, if, it's gonna, if it's of the Lord, then, then it'll fly. And if it's not, find somewhere else to go to church. <laughs> that was no budgets, no nothing. And the Lord has done it. That's the beautiful thing about starting small with nothing when it's just you and your armor bearer. And you look out and you go, it must be the Lord. And so, you know, there's a couple other families that came alongside and said, whatever you're doing, whatever we see the Lord doing in your life, we want to be part of that. Frank and Vicki, I don't see them here tonight, Brad and Stephanie, Greg and Amy Connor, and it's just like, boom, out we go. And it's great to have someone in your life that's got your back, isn't it? Do you know someone, there's someone in your life, there's someone in your life that's got your back. And you know, as I talk about these things in the past, you know, my heart is like, I hope I don't live forever in what God did in my life 14 years ago. And I hope you don't live forever in what, what this was the thing that God did 14 years ago in my life. I'm going, Lord, what's next? What are you gonna call me to do next? What's next for you? So, I, you know, Jonathan attacked the garrison and now he's attacking it again. Time to go again, mount another attack. I love this. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So they're like, we really feel God is calling us you know, to this attack, but here's what we're gonna say. You know, if, if, God, if they say this, then, oh, God's not in this. If they come after us, then God's not in it. But if they say, hey, come, come over to us, 
then we're going to take that as a sign that God's in it. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Can you imagine the, the sarcasm in their voices? Remember, they had scattered, chapter 13, they had scattered because they were so scared of the ginormous, bigger than you can count sands of grain on the, on the seashore army of the Philistines. So they said, Saul, we're out of here. And they were hiding in rocks and caves and all over the place. So they, they say, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. No threat. So Jonathan knows that he's got them off guard. They have underestimated them, just like Goliath underestimates David. You've got to be careful how you judge people. And, and David, Samuel learns this. You know, God doesn't see as man sees. Give me a small guy with big faith rather than a big guy like Saul with no faith in God. And it's awesome. Give me a guy with no seminary training, but loves the Lord, versus a guy with three PhDs and a master's degree who doesn't know God. And you know they exist, right? So he's got, he knows they're going to be off guard. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Look how cocky they are. Look how crass. I mean, they have completely underestimated Jonathan, and that's, I love, I love when people underestimate. I mean, you know the story. I, I hate to tell it again, but I love the story. Because when we went out to, to plant a church, or the, actually, I'm sorry, the first Bible study I ever taught, the, the message I got was, uh, you can go ahead and try it, but no one's going to come. And I, I okay, right, hey, you know, I love to be naive enough to, to not know what the Lord is, is, is you're going to be capable of. I, I didn't say that right at all, but you know what I meant. Naive enough to not know what the Lord can be limited by or something like that. It just gets worse every time I say it. <sighs> come up to us and we will show you something. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after, them, after him and they fell before Jonathan. The cocky Philistines in this little garrison, this little detachment. There's no description of the battle yet. We do get a little bit of information. But here's Jonathan. First, he's got to climb this little rocky cliff to get to the battle. I'd be exhausted by the time I got to the top. I go, okay, guys, hold on a second. I've got to catch my breath. He's a rock climber. And now he's got to enter into battle. But his hands and a knee, hands in, on his hands and knees, climbing this. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed him. So Jonathan, I don't know if you, if you see these shows where you've got some elite military guy, you know, and he's, he, there's a whole five guys attack him. He takes them all out, and we all go, wow, what a cool scene. And that's Jonathan. This is like real life. Jonathan was like special forces. I mean, he takes down, we're going to find out, 20 guys in a half acre of land. That's what he says. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men so they were outnumbered two to one. Or excuse me, is that 10 to one? I'm sorry, 10 to one. They were outnumbered 10 to one. So they killed 20 men in about a half acre of land. Oh, what you can do with little. They didn't, it was this, so the idea is this was in a small uh, battle. It, was, it took place in a small area. You know, and sometimes that's where your ministry starts. That's where the battle is. It's not this big, you know, you want to conquer the world, start with your house. Start with your family. What you can do with half an acre. You know, the, the parable of the, uh, the talents is sort of like that, right? The parable of the talents, one guy gets 10, another guy gets five, another guy gets two or something like that. And it's not about how much you have, it's about what you do with what you have. The guy that has 10, he, he doubles it, and the guy that has five doubles it, and the one guy then he just he doesn't use it at all. He completely misunderstands God. And he blames God because he's lazy. And I don't know what you've been given by God. I don't know what gifting, what calling, what area of influence. But whatever it is, be influential there. You utilize the things that God has given you there. But that's such a small, insignificant thing. Who cares? To you, it might be insignificant. But to God, it might be the most significant thing on the face of the earth. 
You know, there's nothing that warms my heart more than coming in here on Monday, hearing the praise music on and watching the cleaning team, scrubbing the toilets. Doing the, and to, to God, that's a huge thing. Because we're talking about the God who, in, 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 the son of God, who knelt down, took off his, his robe, knelt down, and washed the feet of his disciples. That was a slave's work. That was insignificant work. But to God, it was extremely significant. And so it's us that puts, you know, significance on these things. But I like that. This was the first slaughter, about 20 men within about half an acre of land. Half acres are significant. Aren't they? Aren't they, Stephanie? Yeah. I thought about you. Now, now Michael's going to have to edit this out. But I just thought about you guys while I was studying this. Do you know the Half Acre family? That's their name, Half Acre. And the cool thing is that, uh, that Brad and Stephanie Half Acre were part of the, the team that, that helped plant this church. And so uh, I, just, I just chuckled to myself as I read about 20 men and a half an acre. So Brad and Stephanie Half Acre. So anyway, that's a little personal side note. Verse 15 says, And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled. And the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. So look what happened with Jonathan's little battle on a little battlefield. We're not talking the Valley of Jezreel. We're talking about half an acre of land. And look at the result of his act of faith. Hey, you know, who knows what the Lord will do? Isn't that true? You just step into some small thing, one little step. It's not about having great faith. It's about using the little faith you have. That's it. Just doing something that you go, you know what? I don't know if the Lord, what the Lord's going to do with this. You ever said that? You ever done something? You go, you know what? I don't know what the Lord's going to do with this, but I'm going to give it a shot. I don't know where it's going from here. I don't know what comes next. I don't know how this is going to look. But let's, let's go, because I know what the Lord can do. Now, see, Jonathan's not about what Jonathan can do. Jonathan's about what the Lord can do. Trembling, and, and, and then the Lord joins in. The earth is quaking, so there was a very great trembling. Now the watchman of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked. This is four miles away. And there was a multitude melting away, and they went here and there. And then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who is gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So the, the watchman from Gibeah is looking, you know, surveying the land, and, and they can see in the distance Michmash, and they see all these armies just, just dispersing, the army of the Philistines dispersing and attacking each other, and, they're, and he's going, what is going on over there? What is happening? Who's responsible for this? Count up, who's missing? Count up everybody. Who's, who's missing? Get everybody into ranks. And when they get everybody into ranks, 600 guys, uh-oh, Jonathan is missing. Jonathan's missing. And so Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. So Saul, in one hand, says, hey, get the ark. I mean, it worked so well last time when Hophni and Phinehas carried into battle. Let's try that again. You see, Saul is somewhat of an impulsive guy. And so impulsively, remember, and, 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 Saul is a manipulator. He manipulates people. He manipulates God. And we're going to see that a few times as we go through here. So let's get the ark. We got to, you know, he's always worried about if, if he's going to measure up, if, he, if he's going to win. And he wants to make sure that he does his part to make sure he secures that victory. God always needs help with Saul. Well, actually, the truth is God's never really in the picture but he makes it look like God's in the picture. It's very devious. But then he changes his mind. We can't wait on that. Uh, we can't wait on the ark. Let, let's forget that. Scrap that plan. And uh, then verse 20 says, Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So it seems like there were some Israelite maybe defectors or maybe some had been taken into slavery or whatever the case was, there were some Israelites 
that were sort of mingled into the camp of the Philistines. And when they see the Hebrews kind of winning this battle, they, they join in. They were all the blacksmiths maybe that had been you know, carried over to the Philistine camp. Look again, remember where this started. Jonathan going, I'm not going to check in with my father. I'm just going to get this ball rolling. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they had heard that Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord sa- who saved? The Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Avin. Now look at the momentum that has been gained by the act of faith of one person going, who knows what God could do with this? Isn't that awesome? And that could be you. It can be a little act of kindness that you show to a neighbor. And pretty soon your whole street is now in, you know, getting saved and turning to the Lord. I prayed, I used to pray uh, for, for a revival among the homeless in Charlottesville. I just always thought that would be the coolest thing to see. Lord, would you bring a revival among the homeless population in Charlottesville? I haven't seen it yet, but we've seen some, a cloud the size of a man's hand. God using this church, you guys, to bless and encourage folks that are homeless in Charlottesville. It's awesome to see. What are you praying for? What do you, you know, sometimes we say, oh, Lord, the harvest is great. You know, send out workers, Lord. And God says, I'm going to send out you. You're the worker. No, no, Lord. No, that's not what I meant. That's not what my prayer was. I wanted to pray so you'd send somebody else to the work. Aren't we good at that? I mean, we're good at showing up for Bible study. We're good at showing up for agape meals. We're good at showing up for stuff at church. But when it comes to getting into battle, you know, to actually taking a chance, doing something daring, opening your mouth, opening your home, opening your heart, uh, now that requires something different. We can come, we can raise our hands and sing praises to the Lord. Oh, Lord, you know, I surrender all. Really, Steve? Do you? Oh, I don't know. That's why I don't like man-centered songs, you know. I, I, I like, I surrender some. I surrender hopefully more than last year. I don't know. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on who? My enemies. Wait a second, Saul. So none of the people tasted food. So Paul, Saul puts them under a mandatory fast. All right, if you eat army, you're going to be cursed by God. Now, God never told him to do that. It's dumb for a military commander to to pronounce an oath if his military troops eat. That's just dumb. But again, Saul is a manipulator. And he's, well, if we fast, then we'll twist God's arm. Look, that's not what fasting is for. Fasting is not to twist God's arm to do what you want him to do. And I really mean it, so I really want it, so I'm going to fast. And that's why I'm... Fasting, you know, fasting is bad. For the, for the Pharisees, fasting happened on a regular calendar schedule. It became a religious routine. And, and that's not how fasting works. We just read about fasting, didn't we, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Don't deprive one another intimately, except for a time with mutual consent so you can give yourself to prayer and fasting. I mean, sometimes there's just a time in your life where you go, I don't, I don't, I'm just not... I don't want to eat. I don't want to focus on food right now. I don't want to have to do dishes. I don't want to have to make food. I just need to be seeking the Lord. I need to hear from God. And so I don't want to be worried with food. For the Pharisees, it was religious routine. For a lot of people, religious routine. But for Saul, it was trying to manipulate God. And that's what he was about. And so he makes him make this, uh, this, this oath, take this oath, because it was all about Saul's enemies. Nobody eats food because I have to take vengeance on my enemies. So this is the heart of, uh, of legalism, isn't it? Where other people tell you to take vows that you don't understand and don't even want to take anyway. Well, here's, what's, here's what you have to do. Here's what really makes God happy. If you do this, here's what really makes God happy. If you do that. It's, 
instead of empowering his people for the battle, he's actually disabling them because of his demands caused people stress. Now all the people of the land came to a forest. Watch what happens. And there it was, honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Can you imagine the scene? I mean, their mouths are drooling. You know how it is. The day you decide to go on your diet is the day your coworker brings Krispy Kreme to the office hot, dripping icing, and you're going, oh, I just decided to fast from sweets, and now this, get behind me, Satan. So here's the honey, and it's dripping, and then God told them, you're going to bring into land flowing with milk and honey. So the people are in this dilemma. I mean, they've, they've made this, the, the soldiers have made this vow not to eat, and, and yet here's this beautiful, isn't that how it works, <laughs> gang, when, when you say, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm giving this up for the Lord, and then Boom, that's when temptation hits. <clears throat> but Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore, he stretched out the end of his rod. I mean, if there's honey, what else is there? Somebody say bees. Bees, there's bees there. So in order to not get too close to the bees, but to get some of the honey, Jonathan sticks out his, his rod that was in his hand. He dips it in the honeycomb and puts it to his mouth. I hope he checked it for bees first. Dips it to his mouth, and what happened? His countenance brightened. He ate, he's got, he got a quick, quick carb fix. It's like eating a Snickers bar. And imagine everybody else is watching Jonathan eat this, like, oh, he's going to eat it right in front of us. And they're all wishing they could eat it, but they're scared of this oath that, that they're under. You know, again, this is legalism. Other people make rules. You have to follow them out of fear, but you don't really understand and don't really want to do it. And legalism will always fail for this reason. Watch what happens next. So Jonathan eats it. He perks up. And then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. I mean, they're all, they can barely stand up. They got no energy. This is the army. They've already been in battle. They need to eat. They need nutrition. They need calories. I mean, I, they, they make, you know, when I go out cycling on 100-mile cycling rides, I mean, you got to, if you, it's called, in the cycling world, they call it bonking. You bonk. Isn't that a great word? You bonk, and, and you just run out of energy. You're just done. You just, your feet feel like they've become 100-pound cement blocks, and you just, you just run out of energy. And so Saul's whole army has bonked. But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. That's pretty bold. His father's the king. He says, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. By the way, Psalm 19, maybe you've heard it. The law of the Lord, the instruction of God is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. How are you going to do battle if you're starving? Take some honey. Take a little bit of the word, the word of God, the instruction of God. It's sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. And you can't expect to do battle, spiritual battle, if you are taking in junk food all the time, you're feeding, you're feasting on the world, but you're starving for the word. And I, you know, I, I love one of the comments I hear almost as, as the, almost more often than any other, when uh, folks have come to Calvary Chapel, they've come from other places, and, and, and they get a, a, a taste of the honeycomb of verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching. And a lot of times what people say is, you know, I've learned more here in the last year than I have in the last 20 years being in church. And, you know, it's nothing special that we do. There's no great, there's nothing that we can boast about. All that we're doing is giving people the honey. We're saying, we don't want you to fast. We want you to dig in and enjoy. Feast on, on the word of God. Feast on the honey and the honeycomb. It's sweet, isn't it? Isn't the word of God sweet? I mean, sometimes it's bitter in your mouth, right? Sometimes it's, it's a tough word, but it's sweet. But there's places where, and churches, where pastors are starving their congregations. They're feeding them catchy stories and jokes and vignettes and 12-minute sermonettes for Christianettes. No, they're starving. Watch what happens, too. 
He says, verse 30, how much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Isn't that interesting? So Jonathan knows the Lord accomplished the victory, but he says, how much more could God have done if we had energy? I mean, how much more could God do with you? I mean, if you've settled, like, well, you know, I read my Bible on Sundays when I come to church and that's it. And that's okay. You're not saved by Bible reading. You're not saved by church attendance. But how much more could God do with you? Now, doesn't, doesn't uh, what is it, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is God inspired and profitable for reproof, for, you know, correction and training in righteousness and so that the man or woman of God is fully equipped for every good work. And it's too many of God's people are partially equipped. You know, you're going into battle and you've got fatigues on, but you've got no gun, you've got no flashlight, you know, you've got none of these other things that you need, you've got no compass. How are you going to go into battle with, with that minimal thing? I want to go to battle. I want as much as I can. Load me up, right? Shouldn't that be our attitude? I mean, load me up. I want all of the scripture my mind can bear. I want to meditate on the word of God day and night. How many scriptures can you memorize? Not because you're saved by scripture memorization. Not so you can impress people at parties and at Bible study by quoting scripture. But because when you're in a time of need, all of a sudden, the scripture you have memorized comes back to you and you go, oh, the Spirit of God uses the scriptures you know. The Spirit of God can't use the scriptures you don't know. He can use the scriptures you know. And he brings them to remembrance. I, load me up, Lord, load me up. This is a pretty bold statement. How, he, he contradicts his dad. For years, the church the Catholic Church told people, don't read the Bible. You can't understand it. It's not for you. It's for us. We'll tell you about it. And, and what, a, what, what an awesome thing when the Bible, you know, we take it for granted that you have a Bible. You can have a Bible in your language, and you can read it. You can eat your own honey. Isn't that great? You don't have to go to, to the store here to get honey. I love that. Now, verse 31 says, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ijalon. So the people were very faint, and the people rushed on the spoil and took sheep, oxen, and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. What a, what a feast. What a bloodbath. And all the spoil, they were so hungry. They were so starved. They said, we can't wait anymore. We're, we just, they just dove in and started to devour. Anybody seen the movie Chocolat? Remember that movie? It's a PG-13 movie, I think, but yeah, this woman moves into this city where there was, it was a lot of legalism and, and piety and, and nobody was allowed to enjoy the pleasures of life. And this woman comes in, she opens a chocolate shop and it really causes a stir in their little town. The mayor of the town was the one like, our people are not gonna enjoy these delights and these pleasures. Has anybody seen that movie? Okay, so you know the, the scene when the mayor <laughs> breaks in because he's gonna destroy and kill all the chocolate and as he's destroying all the chocolate, he gets a little on his lip and he tastes it, and he goes, oh, and now he's got to taste it. Now the mayor, who was leading the legalistic charge, now he's devouring it himself. Now, we don't know that Saul is here devouring it, but certainly the people, now they're not supposed to eat with the blood. They're sinning. They're disobeying. And so they, they told Saul, hey, look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. I'm a Saul caused this. So he said, you have dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. No, Saul, you have dealt treacherously. The people just followed your lead. Then Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep. Slaughter them here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. Like Saul's all self-righteous and all, right? This guy is a mess. So every, and he says, bring, oh no, bring your oxen to me. I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. It's self-centered. Everything has to revolve around Saul. So every one of the people brought his ox with him at, that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. Notice what the Lord points out to us. This was the first altar that he had built to the Lord. An altar is a place of sacrifice. We watch Abraham building altars through his life. And something significant happens, and Abraham builds an altar. 
And there he remembers something. He, he thanks God there. He offers to God something there. Saul, he was not a godly-minded man. First time he builds an altar, and it's because the people, just a place where the people can slaughter their animals so they didn't have to do it on the ground. Verse 36 says, Now Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And remember, now they've eaten, so they're ready to go again. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. Hey, that's a good idea. Hey, how about this, Saul? How about we draw near to God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? I mean, it happens to me. I'm so embarrassed. I'm the pastor. And I'm going, Okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And someone says, Hey, Steve, should we pray first? Oh, yeah, we should pray first. I'm just being real with you guys. I mean, I forget. Oh, yeah, we should pray first. Yeah, we should pray. Anybody else with me in that? We do, oh, yeah, I forgot to pray. I forgot to ask God first. Duh. So Saul has this idea, let's go plunder them, and, and all the people say, hey, whatever you say, Saul, we're with you. And the priest said, let us draw near to God here. Uh, so Saul asked counsel of God. Oh, yeah, good idea. Uh, <clears throat> Shalleth I goeth down after thine Philistineth. No, no, he didn't speak King James English. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But look what happened. But he did not answer him that day. He who he God did not answer. Saul's asking, God's not answering. I don't think his request is legit. I, don't th I think he's just putting on a show. This is what Saul does. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, I gotta pray, gotta pray. So he, so he prays. So now look what Saul does when God doesn't answer. Saul said, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. Hey, God's not answering. Must be your fault. Somebody must have broken the curse I put on. That's why God's not answering. Must be your fault for doing that. Another sign of terrible leadership. It's bad enough when he's the king. What's it like when this is the husband? What's it like when this is the president? What's it like when this is the pastor? And the people trying to Live for God in the midst of this messy, messy leadership. Don't tell me you know how that feels. I'll come get you. See, that's what Saul would say, a threat. See, threats. Saul said, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, now he's all spiritual. Though it be in, my, in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among the people answered him. Why? Because they knew... It was Jonathan. Then he said to all Israel, you be on one side and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you, that they keep saying, okay, Saul, well, you're in charge. They're afraid to contradict him. Jonathan wasn't, but they are. Therefore, Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. I mean, in other words, they're gonna draw straws now or they're gonna, it's probably the Urim and the Thummim, they're gonna seek God. So Saul and Jonathan were taken. So it wasn't the people, it was Saul and Jonathan. But the people escaped. I mean, they weren't chosen. And Saul said, cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. I don't know about you, Dad, but I'm, you know, Saul probably knows it's not him. So I don't know what game Saul is playing with Jonathan here. But he says, cast lots between me and my son Jonathan. And so Jonathan was taken. And then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. See, Saul didn't know. And Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, so now I must die? I mean, this is his son. What kind of relationship must they have had? What kind of twisted man must Saul have become that now, because he wants to save face among the people, now he's going to kill his own son. He's going to sacrifice his own son to save face. Oh, I've seen parents do this on the ball field. Don't we, don't, we, we cannot look at Saul and go, oh, I can't believe that guy. I've watched parents sacrifice their sons and their daughters on the altar of athletics for their own glory. It's a shame. It should never be. It should never be. That's a Saul kind of thing to do. And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. You see, this really was an altar moment. Saul had a choice in this moment to do what was right, to humble himself and say, you know what, everybody, listen, that was a stupid vow. 
I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong to make you do it. I was wrong to make Jonathan do it. He didn't even know I'm not going to kill him. Look, I can't kill my own son. Now remember, even as I utter those words, we think about the cross, don't we? And that's what I hear that a lot too. What kind of God would kill his own son? No, 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 no. You misunderstand, person. You misunderstand, atheist. God's son came willingly. He wasn't forced. He wasn't coerced. He wasn't obliged. He wasn't under an oath that he had to take against his will. He did it of his own free will. He came because he wanted to. He came because he loved his father. And and his father loved the world. So it's a whole different thing going on here. But the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground for his work with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. And that was a crucial turning point, wasn't it? You know, up until now, they're, hey, whatever seems right to you, Saul, whatever seems right to you, Saul. But now the people step in. They, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining them lining up in front of Jonathan and saying, Saul, don't you touch him. He's a great man, don't you? You know, sometimes people in, are intimidated when they see other people doing great things and they're not doing great things. And the only answer they have to that is to diminish the people that are actually out there doing the work. You know, it's a lot easier to cast stones It's a lot easier to discredit. It's a lot easier to criticize than it is to actually attempt something yourself. Remember, when you expect great things from God and you attempt great things for God, sometimes you're going to fail. Or at least you're going to be perceived to have failed. And people will criticize. But you know what? That's okay. Let them criticize. I'd rather fail attempting great things for the Lord than succeed at doing nothing for God. Is anybody else with me in that? So let's just finish out the final verses here. Verse 46 says, Then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. So Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them. And he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan, Jishui, and Malkishua, they're all going to die in battle. Saul's going to commit suicide, and their bodies are going to be hung on the wall at Beit Shan. When we go to Israel, we visit Beit Shan, and we read the story uh, about them being killed in battle. And the names of his two daughters were these. The name of the firstborn was Merab, and the name of the younger Michael. She's going to be given to David in marriage. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahmaz, And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. So when we speak of Saul, we see see Saul taking for himself. All right, chapter 15 next week. This is a good one. Don't miss it. This is where we... uh, We really, some of Saul's character is revealed, you know, uh, to obey Saul. To obey is better than sacrifice. And we'll get to that next week. So let's pray. Lord, as we close up, uh, I pray that uh, uh, we know that all the things that are written here in the Old Testament are not just random things that we can study and, and think about, but they're written for our learning, that we might learn from Saul, that we could see and and see ourselves in him and repent of anything that even looks like Saul in my life. Anything that even approaches that kind of life. Lord, I know there's things that I don't even see in myself. But Lord, as we point them out in Saul, we we just see this as a mirror and you're correcting, you're challenging, you're teaching us. So Lord, we want to be more like Christ, less like Saul. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen, amen.